Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, Episode 3, Oscars Aftermath. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, with my lovely co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about a few topics from this week's news in entertainment. Uh, We'll be talking about Emma Thompson refusing to work with John Lasseter on a new project, Luke Perry suffering a massive stroke, and then we'll dive a little deeper into the Oscars aftermath and the controversy surrounding this year's Oscars. So, Emma Thompson uh, was slated to do a voice part in a new animated feature film from Skydance Animation. She was signed on to do the work already. The the film was called Luck. Okay. Uh, There hasn't been much detail released about the plot or anything, but the real controversy here was Skydance recently hired John Lasseter, who uh, previously was head of animation at... Pixar. Pixar and Disney. And Disney. And uh, he was accused of sexual misconduct by several people at his former employer. He took a year off, eventually wound up leaving Pixar, and came on as the head of animation at Skydance. Emma Thompson wrote a scathing letter to Skydance management criticizing their decision to hire Lasseter, and I quote, If a man has been touching women inappropriately for decades, why would a woman want to work for him if the only reason he's not touching them inappropriately now is that it says in his contract he must behave professionally? Mm. Uh, She goes on to say uh, that she's aware centuries of entitlement to women's bodies, whether they like it or not, is not going to change overnight. She says, I'm also aware... That if people who have spoken out like me do not take this sort of stand, then things are very unlikely to change at anything like the pace required to protect my daughter's generation. So I applaud her for her stance. Absolutely. Um, To her, you know, fixing what is a significant issue in the industry is far more important to her than the money. Yeah, and and it's not just in entertainment, it's predominantly known in entertainment but as we've seen over the the past couple of years months it's everywhere it's in every industry absolutely absolutely and i think i think her efforts here really set the standard for what people need to do you know it's it's one thing to rail against the system and point it out and support those who are victims of it, it's another one to draw a line in the sand and say, no more, it it, it stops here. Right, and, and that's the biggest thing is that it needs to, at some point, stop. It yes. needs to stop being acceptable. It's not the boys' club anymore or, oh, it happened so many years ago. Like, at, at what point... Do we start forgiving people for what they did? Because all you're doing is showing, oh, well, if you did that 10 years ago, you did that 15 years ago, it's okay to, you know, now you're, you're better. It's, it's fine. You need to hold people accountable for, for what they did. Well, and that, that era of forgiveness is kind of contrary to how we look at history to begin with. I mean, you don't look back at slavery and say, oh, it was okay you're sorry you did it back then, or segregation, or at no point in time was it ever okay. So at no point in time was there total forgiveness to those who were guilty of doing it. Right. CEO David Ellison of Sky da- uh, Skydance Animation responded to the letter, at first saying he did not enter into the decision, meaning the decision to hire Lasseter lightly. He goes on to say that John has acknowledged and apologized for his mistakes, and during the past year away from the workplace has endeavored to address and reform them. So should John Lasseter be forgiven because he apologized and took a year off? Well, I guess it also goes 
if you look at, you know, somebody that goes to jail and gets released on parole, you know, at what point do you forgive them for what they did or allow them to be rehabilitated and and go back in into society? It's almost that, you know, if it's okay for somebody that, you know, uh, stole a car and now they paid their debt to society... Are but, they allowed to be... But has Lasseter paid his debt to society? Probably not, if it's only been a year. Uh, well, he didn't go to prison And he didn't for go it. to prison. He basically took a year off from work. Right, and was there and any... Apologized. There's been no official remediation. There's been no... Right, uh, were charges um, brought up. And I think that's also the the fine line of the whole sexual misconduct is them their word against somebody else's and how many people not to say that the the women accusing were lying or not but it, it's 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 just such a fine you don't want to discredit any person that comes forward but at what point you know what are the actions that you take you know, well, and, against it. It's a, it's... And I understand that without a conviction, it's very difficult to really lambaste someone for it. But right. the thing is, and, and I can only speculate, because I've never actually experienced it, but I can only speculate that from the perspective of the victim, it's got to be torturous to try to go through a trial with something like this. Oh, absolutely. And having to, to relive something all over again and where you have your lawyer or, you know, your side of the, you know, being very forgiving, but you know that the defense is going to railroad, drag you through the dirt, railroad you and bring up every little thing. And, you know, it gets to the point of, well, you wore this really low cut dress that day. So, you know, and make it out to, and to feel like it's your fault. It's sad that that type of defense is appropriate because under no circumstances should what I wear Absolutely. be an invitation to someone to sexually assault me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and that's the thing is how many women came forward, what what transpired, you know, is it ever, you know, anything, you know, obviously if another company hired him and it's only been a year, they obviously didn't feel it was that bad not to say that that's a good thing well, versus look at some of the other people who have been ousted who haven't worked since then correct, and yeah. have gone into seclusion and you know so what is you know what was it that that actually happened was it inappropriate you know was it the flirting touching was it well the one thing that was predominantly accused of Lasseter was he was a hugger, and he had a tendency to hug most of the women in the office. And some women took offense to the casual hugging. Other women suggested that the hugging was more than just hugging. Mm -hmm. um, Lasseter, for his part in this instance, released a statement of his own saying that I am resolute in my commitment to build an animation studio upon a foundation of quality, safety, trust, and mutual respect, um, which honestly says absolutely nothing to address right. Emma Thompson's concerns, which I think is a disservice to her. Absolutely. Um, I mean, he's he's speaking broadly from almost a legally standpoint. They're making oh, sure he absolutely. doesn't say anything controversial. Right. And, you know, it, passing judgment as I can sitting where I'm at right now, that sounds an awful lot like a guilty person to me. Mm. Like he knows he did something wrong and he's basically trying to rebuild his career. Right, and I think in the grand scheme of things, again, not saying that one person's complaint over somebody else is, it's not like he was locking himself in a hotel room and asking for sexual favors to be done where somebody wasn't going to get a part right. in a movie like other well, and people in the industry have. Nothing that blatant, but... Has come out that Correct. we know of, but Correct. I'm sure if... There was something to that effect. It would have come out. But, I mean, we, we weren't there, so we don't know what the circumstances Absolutely. are. But I can certainly see where someone rejecting his, what he thinks is an innocent 
intimate embrace mm-hmm. from a camaraderie standpoint. Right. Someone rejecting that or complaining about that or filing a complaint, I could totally see repercussions. Absolutely. To that. And there's that's insinuated when that happens. So yes, you're not forcing yourself on anyone. Right. You are that threat is overriding when you reje- reject that kind of thing when it's something that's done on a regular basis and other people accept it right and i think that also kind of with with that thing the hugging and the the personal space our generation and even before it was always you know you saw a relative give them a hug everybody give them a hug you you know don't be rude where now it's okay to tell your children if you don't feel comfortable giving somebody a hug you don't have to give them a hug if you want to just shake their hand, you shake their hand. It's it's everybody's own personal personal sure. take. So I could see where, oh, it's just a hug. It's no big yeah. deal. But if it's something well, that makes you uncomfortable and you didn't do it and it was a commonplace activity at work. But the other thing is in... <clears throat> The current environment, absolutely. The, we're not we're not early on in the Me Too movement. We're we're pretty far in. We've mm-hmm. had enough incidents to know what is and isn't appropriate, right? And his violations were right in the midst of it. You mm-hmm. would have you would have thought there would have been enough common sense to say, okay, let's back off of what I think are friendly gestures and let's just keep things professional, right? And he didn't do that. We'll see how that works out. I don't know who. There's been no word on who's going to replace. Uh, Emma Thompson in that role at this point in time. Uh, There was news uh, earlier this week that uh, Luke Perry suffered a massive stroke, Mm. uh, which came as a shock to me. Luke Perry is only 52 years old. Obviously, he's a a former um, actor from Beverly Hills 90210 and Riverdale. Uh, suffered a stroke on Wednesday. According to TMZ, paramedics responded to a call at the Star's home in Sherman Oaks, California at approximately 9.40 on Wednesday morning. In my research, I did see that Perry had previously revealed uh, in an interview with Fox News that doctors found precancerous growth in his colon oh, wow. after a colonoscopy in 2015. Now, I mentioned that because that's the only other medical news that I've seen on him, but there's mm-hmm. been no suggestion that there's a connection between the two at this okay. point. Uh, a rep for Perry uh, indicated the actor is currently under observation at the hospital. And you know, ironically, this came uh, the same day that news was released that uh, a reboot of Beverly Hills 90210 was in the works. Perry was not going to be a part of it. Okay. So obviously not related, but certainly worth worth talking about. Uh, were you a fan of Beverly Hills 902? I was, and Dylan was my favorite because he was the bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a poster of him in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I saw him every day. No. <laughs> uh, 52, though. That's, that's that's pretty young. Yeah, and, and you know, we were talking, you know, the, the other week with, you know, with Peter Tork, and, you know, now it's somebody even closer in age to, you know ourselves but we won't talk about how much closer in age no we won't (laughs) thanks i appreciate that um yeah again it's that whole mortality you know it doesn't matter now how old or how young yeah you know it just makes you think that life is just you know precious and you need to make every moment last and and you know live each day to to the fullest and Hopefully it wasn't a major stroke and after rehab or whatnot, you know, he'll be, yeah. he'll be back to himself. There were uh, initial reports that the hospital had him in an induced coma, although uh, Rep for Perry came out and denied that at this point mm-hmm. in time. So That seems to be a very typical thing. Well, the fact that they're playing this so close to the vest and not giving any real details on this is, is more frightening than anything, mm-hmm. I think. Um, usually if, if someone is not seriously ill, you know, you tend to get more, more details. It's when they, when they're tight lipped that I tend to worry. It could also be his family too, not releasing information. That is true. That is true. We wish him well. Um, I, I, I wish a speedy recovery to him. (laughs) 
let's talk about the Oscars, more specifically the aftermath of the Oscars. I want to point out a few of the notable winners, and then there's a few other stories that are Oscar-related that I'd like to talk about. Sure. So, Best Picture went to Green Book. I don't know if this came as a surprise to anyone. Uh, I think it was a disappointment to a few people who were in the running. Um, I haven't seen the movie myself, um, but I've heard some things about the movie. Okay. Uh, Some things we'll talk about in a minute that sort of question some of the legitimacy of the story and, and... some of the creative license that was given to it. Best actor, and I'm probably going to pronounce this name wrong. Can you pronounce it for me? Well, it's Rami is his first name. It's Rami Malik, I assume? Yes, Rami Malik. Rami Malik, Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Which we still have yet to see. We have yet to see. Uh, although in the <laughs> clips that I have seen, he's pretty much spot on. Oh, absolutely. Not much controversy there. I think a lot of people thought he would have taken that. Um, Because he won basically all the pre-Oscar awards for it. Did he win? He won the Golden Globe Mm -hmm. for it? He did. Okay. I thought he did. He didn't have a spill, though. After accepting the award, he fell off stage, did he not? Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. There was, he was, you know, I think he was even rushed to the hospital, but apparently he wasn't seriously Oh, I didn't even hear that. Yeah. Uh, Best Actress went to Olivia Coleman for The Favorite. Any thoughts on that? That was, I think, a, a surprise. A, a lot of people were thinking it was going to go to to somebody else. Um, and I remember seeing tweets afterwards that everybody absolutely loved her. You know, her speech and, yeah. you know, now everybody wants to be your best friend. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so. Well, that's always the case, isn't it? Yeah. When you, when yeah. you win an award. Uh, best Supporting Actor. And this is another name I'm probably going to murder here. Um, Mahershala Ali, I believe so, for his role in Green Book. Green Book. Mm-hmm. Thoughts on that? Not much of a surprise there. I give, no, uh, give again, he was another one. And that's the thing is, by the time the Oscars come out, more than not, you know, most of those people have have been winning, or it's back and forth between, you know, one or two people. Yeah. Uh, Best Supporting Actress went to Regina King for If Bill Street Could Talk. And everybody, she was the the favorite, the for favorite, that. and and very very deserving from you know clips that I I saw, and just very very thankful for where she's come from and and whatnot. The one thing that I think struck me more than anything was the fact that unlike recent previous Oscars, there were no major sweeps. No, and and I believe we were even talking about that. It it almost felt as if everybody got something. It was almost like it was a participation award. Yeah, it almost was, like it was predetermined that we would distribute <coughs> the awards evenly. Right. Bohemian Rhapsody got a bunch of different things, and the Klansmen, uh, Black Klansmen, they got a bunch of things, and the favorite got a bunch of things, and this one, and you know, sure, yeah. um, a star is born, and uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Like everybody went home with something in some way, shape, or form. And the one that actually sh- struck me was the um, foreign movie from Roma. Roma, yes, and that swept. I think that one actually won the most out of... And f- for by all accounts, I haven't seen it yet, but it's been highly recommended that I watch it. And it was a Netflix movie. It was. And um, that's where it, it kind of, you know, where you see now with, um, like, the Emmys. You know, in the beginning, it was very much, if it wasn't NBC, ABC, CBS, it wasn't nominated. And then over time... Fox shows started and CW shows and now you look at it and it's mostly Netflix television shows that are are getting the the Emmys and Amazon Prime and and things like that. So it it was just very shocking hearing because I hadn't really heard the list of the nominations before it came out and to (laughs) see everything and it was Roman. I'm like, wasn't that Netflix? That that just Well, and seemed... the interesting thing is in order to qualify for an Oscar, you have to have appeared in theaters. Well, and that's what I thought. So obviously It did. It, it appeared did. in like four or five theaters right. just 
for the sole purpose right. of qualifying. Because I know that that's what they end up doing towards the end of a year. If a movie isn't supposed to be really released until the following year, they'll do that so it's in consideration for the Oscars. So I figured it had to, at some point, have been released. But it was just kind of shocking how... You know, you had the best actress from it and you had, you know, and the the person that won for, for best actor. Right. It was that, you know, it was just like, wow, okay. Well, and, and on that subject, one of the things that kind of came out that I didn't actually have in our controversial list to talk about was Steven Spielberg has been a staunch opponent of Netflix being in consideration for Oscars. Oh, okay. Uh, and apparently he's taken some heat recently for some of his comments on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. How do you feel about it? Do you, do you, I mean, if it's quality movie. And that's the thing is I've watched a fair bit of content from from Netflix. I've, I've watched series and I've, I've watched, you know, a, a bunch of different movies and it's it's quality stuff it's you know and and the other thing too is i don't have to leave my house to go watch it you know i can start watching it in the morning take a break and and finish watching it so it definitely is easier to to view than going to the movies um you know going back to to one of our first topics of how do we consume our media it, it makes it very convenient to just be able to sit at home and, and watch the movie. Whereas, you know, for us, um, you know, in the area that we live, all of our movie theaters now have assigned seats. And the one movie theater in particular, if you don't buy your tickets two days in advance, you're not going to be able to just go to the movie that same day. Like you used to be able to, hey, what are we doing today? Oh, let's go go see a movie. So the convenience of having it available on Netflix, and I know also um, Comcast is doing things now where you can do, uh, there are certain movies that are in the theater now that you can watch through Netflix, uh, not Netflix, through your on-demand with Xfinity, you know, you can do that. But I think it just makes it So from a content working. creation standpoint, just to throw a few numbers out there, uh, in 2017, Netflix spent six billion on original content. Okay. 2018, they spent close to 13 billion on original content, and in 2019, they're looking to spend upwards of 15 billion. I believe it. Those are some real big studio numbers mm-hmm. they're throwing out there for all the content they're creating. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what we saw, what we're seeing now, is a fundamental shift in how. Oscars are seeing this Mm -hmm. you know it's not you don't need to have something in the theater to be a qualifier at this point in time and you shouldn't have to in my opinion because I think I think your streaming media services are as legitimate as movie theaters are now even though you can't track ticket sales right you can certainly you can still track eyes that are on it absolutely you can you can track you know who's watching it or how often you know it might be something where somebody's going back and watching a movie multiple times so there were a couple of controversies that surrounded this year's oscars and the the first most obvious one was the show host controversy uh kevin hart was originally supposed to host the oscars Mm -hmm. uh until some nearly decades old tweets that were homophobic in nature surfaced right uh caused some controversy and he willingly backed out of hosting right. um you know the they balked at who they were going to bring in eventually mm-hmm. they brought no one in right they, they and had no honestly host. it really for me and i've watched the oscars for as long as i can remember and it really didn't make much of a difference you know i i don't think i i missed having that witty bat banter of sure. of somebody introducing somebody else they had you know their voiceover person who would announce who was coming up next and 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 it moved and it moved along one of the um other points that was kind of 
anti-traditional in Oscars was their desire to cut the broadcast short. And, and in doing that, they explored two different things. One was the original idea was to limit the number of best original song performances to just two, not to showcase all of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, they, they kind of compromised on that. They did 90-second clips of all of them of each one, with right. the two feature performances. Uh, the other was presenting awards during commercial breaks. They had proposed presenting awards for cinematography, editing, live action short, makeup and hairstyling during commercial breaks. Um, some they didn't, I know. I don't know if they did any of them during right, commercial I don't breaks. I think I don't remember them doing any. I I do remember that there was one person that won an award that kind of made a joke, thank you for not doing this during a commercial a commercial yeah. break. So So do you think the broadcast length of the Oscars is an issue and should it should they take measures like this to shorten it? It's always such a long long night, you know. It starts usually I believe it starts at 8 and it goes till about midnight. I think a lot of it is also just the commercials in general yeah. for it. Yeah. If they, you know, kind of move that along. And there really wasn't as many uh, skits as per se other years. You know, there there was um, uh, for, I b- believe it was best costume and costume design, um, Melissa McCarthy and I don't remember who the, the gentleman was. They basically came out in costumes that represented every movie that was nominated so he was dressed kind of like mary poppins and she was dressed in um uh, a gown from the turn of the century and i guess there were animals involved so she had stuffed animals taped to her and it was like a hodgepodge of so it was kind of funny it was witty and it was it was cute and then there were some that just kind of came out and and did their thing, and and it was totally fine. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a way you can cut, you know, a couple of minutes here and there. Obviously, they they keep the speeches, the acceptance speeches, down to a certain time frame because they'll, you know, they'll go to commercial, they'll turn the music on, and you know, cut the people off. I always feel bad for the ones where it's a collaboration award, and you have four or five people that come up and you know the one person talks and and takes up all the time and you have the the one poor guy that just wants to thank his wife yeah. you know you almost would hope okay well let's give them an extra five seconds or an extra 10 seconds or if somebody doesn't use up all their time you know <laughs> let, right. let, let them borrow it here's here's your ticket for an extra five seconds green book mm-hmm we said we had a little bit of controversy with that. There's, there was really two things. Um, there was a claim from the family, the surviving family of Don Shirley, who is the main character okay. in the book. They weren't particularly happy with the way the movie played out. Uh, they described it as a symphony of lies. I haven't seen a movie yet, so I can't pass judgment right. on authenticity or anything like that. But that's kind of a significant condemnation coming from the family there. Now, was it that the book that it was based off of they they spoke simply towards the movie itself towards the movie okay um and there was a second you know i think different controversy uh there was a interview uh, in which the uh star vigo mortensen was being asked questions about the the movie and the Mm -hmm. setting and the content uh the the consequences of the movie and he made a statement uh, in which he used the N-word to highlight changes in society towards race relations since the 1960s, uh, which he then offered a, a what struck me as a heartfelt apology afterwards. Mm-hmm. Did not use it in a demeaning way. Basically right. used it, the contents, the context in which he said it was, look at how we use the N-word today versus, versus how we how use it, it in 1960. Um, so he wasn't doing it in a way that was demeaning, but he, in upon further reflection, appreciated the sensitivity of it and realized having even said in his apology, having a white male use that word is highly inappropriate. So, Absolutely. So clearly he wasn't expressing racism right, itself, but right. 
It did. He did take some. He had, heat he had a for point that. to make, and probably could have made it without even correct using yeah. the word. Other than that, the Oscars I think went off fairly smoothly, given yeah. the the hosting controversy yeah. that they had. Any surprises that you you could think of? No, not really. And again, because I hadn't seen a lot of the movies, just going based off of clips that I had seen or things I had heard, it seemed to be, oh, okay, yeah, they were deserving. Oh, yeah, that was clearly, deserving, you know. Clearly we need to get our SAG membership so we get those screeners <laughs> so we can see these. That would be awesome. Uh, I wouldn't mind. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of getting out to the theater to see all of these. <laughs> Absolutely. The if manner. they were on Netflix, we could watch them. So that brings us to our insightful picks Awesome. Of the week. Um, as usual, I shall let you go first, my dear. Aw, aren't you sweet? So, speaking of Netflix, <laughs> um, again, it's one of those things I kind of had heard about, piqued my interest. It's kind of of the genre that I like, and my insightful pick for this week is a relatively new show that came on. Uh, called The Umbrella Academy. It is based off of a um, series of comics and graphic novels that were actually written and created by the lead singer of My Chemical Romance, Gerald Way, who I had no idea that he had written these. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Sabrina the Teenage Witch that Netflix had just... Uh, done last year that dark comedy type um show which tends to be the type that i i kind of like um i just finished binge watching because that's what you do with netflix um last night and i'm already looking forward to season two and they actually just announced uh last week i believe that season two is in the works which is interesting because the comic series from what i understand basically ended with where the television series ended um so it'll be interesting to see where they go forward in uh the series because there's nothing so what's the premise of the of the show so the premise of the show is that there's this um crazy man who you kind of find out something in the last episode a little bit more about him you know uh, then, then meets the eye and something happens where 43 children are all mysteriously born on the same day at the same hour all over the world. And he basically wants to try and adopt all of them. And he ends up only being able to adopt seven. And for some reason they have some, each member of the family each child has some sort of superpower and he kind of harnesses them and trains them and they become the umbrella academy and basically become crime fighters um sounds very x-men-ish yeah and the one basically is kind of um the cat uh the the black sheep i guess so she's not allowed to be part because she doesn't seem to have a power. So she's kind of the helper. Mm. So whenever they go out, it's the five children or it's the, the six remaining siblings. And then there was an accident at some point. So the one sibling had passed away and then the other one kind of vanished. So it, it, it starts off a little bit when they're younger and then kind of fast forwards like 17 years into the present and things kind of happen between time travel and uh, various different issues that come up. And just overall, uh, I felt it was very entertaining and being that comic book type, um, uh, like you said, kind of the X-Men meet Sabrina right, uh, right. type thing. So uh, very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Very interesting. My pick of the week this week is, Kind of a little off the beaten path. Um, and there's a little story behind it. So 
Uh, I happen to be looking for whimsically a, an acoustic version of Hotel California one night, Big Eagles, the rock band fan. And I just did a quick search on YouTube because I knew there was a number of uh, uh, tutorials that were out there that were exactly what I was looking for. I wanted to see the step-by-step walkthrough. And I came across this one particular musician. Uh, she is from Sweden with uh, uh, descent from Argentina. Her father and mother are both uh, Argentinian. Um, she learned to play guitar at age 12. And she mastered a style called fingerstyle guitar. Uh, and this is as opposed to using a single pick to to flat strum. Mm-hmm. Um, she plays using all of her fingers. Um, and it's, it's not an uncommon style, but it's a difficult style to master mm-hmm. because when you listen to her play, she plays literally four different parts at one time, which I think is extraordinary. Uh, her name is Gabriela Quevedo. Uh, she can be found at Gabriela9797 on YouTube. Uh, she's done a series of YouTube videos um, of all types of music. Um, she's done Red Hot Chili Peppers. She's done The Eagles. She's done ABBA. Uh, she's done Eric Clapton. Mm-hmm. Just a fantastic sound. It's it's such a almost hypnotizing, melodic sound listening to her play, uh, especially pieces that you know, I'm not a musician or a guitarist myself, but I, I know some of these pieces are rather difficult to play, like Hotel California. And she literally plays three parts in Hotel California. Wow. Um, so it's it's something to listen to. It, it struck me to the core listening mm-hmm. listening to her. Uh, she does have one album out on iTunes uh, that is a, a collection of her work. I would highly recommend looking her up and at least appreciating some of the work that she's done mm-hmm. on YouTube. Um, I was very, very satisfied with the search that I did and, and the purchase I did because I listened to two songs on YouTube and had to go out and find the album. Buy that's it. impressive, yeah. So, but that's it for my insightful pick. Did you have any final thoughts, dear? Well, we're getting ready to get into uh, convention season and toy show season, so I think... That'll be something to uh, listen for in our future uh, podcasts. Yes, it will be. That is always a fun time of year for us. Absolutely. But I think that will do it for us today. Thank you for joining me, dear. Thank you as always. And we'll talk to you all next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.